So today I'm going to talk uh, about introduction to text mining. Um, I'm going to start with the motivation, background about text and definitions. Then I'm going to talk about um, some models. And lastly, I'm going to present uh, lab projects that involves text mining. Uh, as you uh, have experienced in the lab, you were working with uh, many types of data and data can be basically categorized into three different uh, categories or three different groups. The first one is structured, structured data, uh, for example, tables. Um, another type of uh, data can be semi-structured, for example, emails. Why is it semi-structured? Because if you have uh, in an email, in an email we have uh, um, fields like the to and from. These are fields that we know exactly what we're going to get there. Uh, we we expect to get their email addresses, but in the body of the email we can get any type of information. It can be textual information. It can be numerical information. It can be photos videos everything and lastly we have unstructured data such as text and textual information textual data is dramatically going over time mainly because the use of the internet and all of these social apps like twitter facebook um, we post a lot of textual information online but also research literature um, such as the one that is indexed uh, on PubMed. And going into details for regarding biomedical textual data, we have seen explosive growth of biomedical literature. Here on the bottom right, you can see a figure that describes the number of papers that are indexed in PubMed. You can see that it's in millions, and you can see that it's dramatically growing over time. And we know that data volume is doubling every two years, and approximately 79% of it is textual data. And this creates a great problem for, especially for researchers um, like us, because um, we need a way to read all of the information or get the most uh, relevant information to our studies because we want to be at the front of technology, at the front of the, of, the, of the knowledge, to use the most recent knowledge. But people cannot read and obtain insights quickly from so much text. A recent example is the publishing of thousands of research articles related to COVID-19 research uh, that were published since March 2020. And there's Absolutely, it's uh, very hard to read all of these papers. Uh, this link here shows you an effort with uh, uh, over uh, 180 scholar articles and approximately 80,000 full texts that were published in Kaggle. And they're asking people to try to help and get insights about COVID-19 um, by analyzing textual information, textual data. And there's a prize, I think it's uh, $1,000, if I'm not mistaken. But how can we deal with this problem? So we have a problem we want to be able to analyze and we want to be able to extract insights from multiple publications uh, obviously, humans are not that good in this uh, in this task because humans make an excellent job, but it takes time. So the solution would be to create tools to help people analyze text. Uh, going further into details regarding biomedical literature mining, we need to kind of understand the research area that we would like to apply machine learning or natural language processing or text mining models to. Um, so our data set, which is biomedical literature mining, uh, has mostly uh, easy access. 
it's very easy to access it, right? Because papers are indexed on PubMed and Medline, and they have APIs that we can use, so we can easily download information. These articles and papers are um, often or almost every paper is uh, using professional professional language, and they have uh, diverse ways to express the same concept. And lastly, the, uh, the, the, the difference between biomedical literature and social media, for example, or other types of textual data on the web is that papers or articles are lengthy with diverse content on new biomedical knowledge, right? Tweets are pretty short, up to 220 and 40 characters, but papers usually have several pages. So you would hear a lot when, you, if you want to analyze text, you would hear uh, many times the term text mining. And I want to define it before uh, we go uh, and dive into the models that exist. Text mining is automatic discovery of new knowledge from textual data. One of the main texts, the main task of text mining is text retrieval, information extraction, and the goal is to discover new relations between extracted pieces of information. Uh, you can look at this illustration figure here and see how the stages uh, of the of text mining are, are being processed. We begin with a huge, usually it's a huge corpus of data, of textual data. We need a way to make it structural. We don't, I haven't talked about yet how to uh, trans transfer information from text into structural data, but we will talk about it later today. Then we can do text mining on the structured data, extract knowledge, and the idea is to develop applications that can use this knowledge. We don't do it just for fun to extract the knowledge. We would like to uh, have applications that know how to utilize this knowledge and kind of help uh, humanity. For example, you can uh, uh, have patients with uh, charts. We can have an application that analyzes what the doctors have uh, written in a chart of a patient, and we can automatically detect if there is a, a rare disease to that patient, of, or if is, this patient is using different types of drugs that can have side effects that are very dangerous and uh, the doctor is not aware of. Or we can just highlight this information to the doctor and say, hey, beware of this uh, drug combination. Um, another term that you would uh, often hear when you're dealing with uh, text analysis is natural language processing, which is basically an extension or an expanding of text mining. Text mining is only dealing with the analysis of the text, like simple tasks, for example, tokenization, amortization, or doing specific tasks on the text, on the words. Natural language processing is more extensive. It tries to learn a computer how to understand the language. But first, I want to talk about what is a language. It's a complex communication system. It is used by humans to communicate, but not only humans, right? Animals use it also. For example, you can see here a paper that use uh, the authors use machine learning to decode the squeaks of bats. Um, so actually there is now a model that can un fully understand the language of bats. Humans usually use in a language two types of communication, textual communication, for example, tweets, emails, SMS, and verbal, verbal information um, like Skype, phone calls, and this class. But what is natural about the language? It's naturally occurring and evolving over time. 
right? Like uh, a, a good example is the use of words that is different than a dictionary. And um, we can use the um, different words in different meanings. And it is not well defined or structured. Uh, well defined structured language that you know is, for example, Python. It is well defined. If you're not, if you don't follow the rules, you won't be able to run your programs. You will have runtime errors. Uh, but a language can definitely um, uh, be used with different grammar or um, um, or some mistake. It is able to tolerate um, different mistake, and we will understand each other. And lastly, I want to define, I talked about natural language. I want to talk about the processing. What is natural language processing? It's a computational understanding of the natural language. For example, English or bad language, as I presented before in the previous slide. We help a computer or we uh, make a computer understand the language that we talk among us. So a computer can read the articles very quickly and give us a summary. One of uh, three of the main common tasks that natural language processing or NLP in short is using is text classification, semantic analysis, as for example, you can see here, this is a, an Amazon review about a bar. And if you as humans read this uh, description, we can see that this bar is uh, exactly what you need or exactly what you want, right? It's a very positive, looks like a positive and promising uh, bar. And then we see, but buyers beware. So we as you may understand that these walls are not that positive. So beware, we know that this bar maybe has, it's not that great for us to buy. Maybe we want to reconsider it. But we want a computer to be able to re read it and be able to say, okay, so the semantic analysis of this paragraph is not 100% positive but it's not 100% negative, right? So it's somewhere in between. And another example is named entity recognition. And we want a computer to be able to read paragraph or a title like this one, for example, on the top right. Uh, this is a paper that Avi found which is related to pain. And uh, we want a computer to read this title and understand that this sequence of letters, letters here, is a gene and we want it, want the computer to understand that it is related to humans so it's uh, a gene related to humans how can we teach a computer to understand that this sequence of letter is a gene and not the word human so it is able we are able to do it there are models that are able to do it um, some of them i will explain today and language is not about words and what they mean. People often uh, do make this mistake. They think that the language is just a word and what the world are uh, supposed to mean. But it's not. It's about people. It's about us and what we mean when we say uh, uh, different kinds of words in different contexts. Let's take a very recent example. Uh, this was published on Yahoo. Is uh, uh, this uh, an article that I recently read, and it was very interesting because it says that TikTokers are using the secret code I had passed that tonight, uh, but they use it because they want to say to the world, "We are going to commit suicide." Uh, so how do how was this discovered? Because uh, people were kind of amazed of what what why other people show uh, that they had passed it tonight and then you look at the comments and they saw that uh, other people are telling them hey don't commit suicide so a computer needs to read this sentence i had passed it tonight and understand that the pasta here in this sentence in this context mean means that 
this person is going to commit a suicide. So we don't care about the dictionary meaning of the word, we care about the context meaning of the word. Taking it from another angle, from biomedical data, we have different forms of the same biomedical term. For example, we have drugs that have different names, or we have gene and protein synonyms, and we want to be able to read papers and understand that although uh, two drugs, they have different names or synonyms, they describe the same uh, functionality. So we want to be able to read the, the two different papers with two different drug names and be able to understand that those two different papers talk about the same drug, even though the drugs have different names. Uh, this problem is still uh, uh, under work. It is not completely solved, but there are um, some progress made in this field. Okay, so we know that we need to teach a computer how to uh, how to read text. We want to teach a computer to understand the language, but how are we going to do it? We can't just feed raw text into a computer and hope that magic would happen and suddenly a computer would understand the language, right? We because computers work with numbers, they do not understand raw text. We need to represent somehow textual information or textual data as numbers. Uh, first of all, we can take sentences and break them into singular words. This is called tokenization. It is splitting text into words. Uh, then we can use stemming or lemmatization because sometimes in text we see different variation of the same words, for example, table and tables. We want to take the word table and tables and break them to the uh, root form. And Just a quick question. Um, yes, do you think that uh, this lemmatization could also be a problem because sometimes in the context that might change the meaning? Um, I'm not sure if it's a different meaning, but yes, you're correct that sometimes we get uh, words that have no meaning because uh, the lemmatization just cut them and you get, for example, uh, the word LE. What does LE represent? But the model is. Uh, keeps the same um, the same approach over all words so if you cut the same word several times different words um, several times you would get the same results every time so it kind of maintain the same the same approach uh, every time but yes it, it does make mistakes that sometimes we have to deal with them and you you can look at the data after applying stemming or lemmatization and see if it worked or not. But uh, more uh, recent models, they are smarter and they uh, apply more sophisticated algorithms. Uh, for example, word to vec you don't have to remove stop words, you don't have to do stemming and lemmatization because the model can learn the context and the, by context, I will define the, the term context later on, but the context is just the neighboring words, the surrounding, the paragraph that you see a word in, and you can kind of teach the computer understand the table and tables is the same. But, but often also these models make, mis make mistakes because um, semantically, Similar, semantically similar words will be also uh, um, will be also be discovered as uh, as having the same context. For example, happy and sad, you will use them in the sentence um, very similarly. Um, does that make sense, or do you have a following question? Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Okay, we don't, as I said, we don't have to remove stop words. We, can, we need to consider if our problem um, is being improved if we remove stop words, but we, we definitely um, can remove them or just keep them. There is a list of stop, stop words in several packages in Python, and you can use them to remove this. An example of a sentence, the red 
world is considered as a stop world and we can remove it because it doesn't add any information to the analysis of this sentence. Examples of models that represent each world as vectors. So let's say now that we have a sentence, we can either use this method to kind of break sentences into words. Uh, we can use uh, any or all of the methods here. And then, okay, so we have different words. Instead of a sentence, now we have words. And okay, the computer still can't read single words. We have to do something. We have to kind of make them uh, yeah, present them in, an, in a numerical representation. So we can use uh, different kind of models, for example, TFIDF, world to vec or BERT. All of these models use vector representation of words. What can we do with NLP models? We can, for example, detect topics in a corpus of documents. Assume we have a collection of many documents and we want to understand what these documents are talking about. So here you can see an example from a recent talk that I uh, presented at the lab, which is a biomedical tool and databases collected from PubMed. We found nine different topics and you can see topic number one. These are the top 20 words that describe it. So we see that uh, all the papers that belongs, that affiliate uh, with topic number one, uh, mostly around gene expression, patient tissue. We can kind of understand what this topic is about. Another, um, another test that we can perform with NLP models is name entity recognition. Uh, for example, detect gene and dog names in articles. Uh, think of it, it's kind of cool. You can, instead of reading papers, you can apply mod those natural language processing models to a paper and decide if this paper is talking about a specific gene or a drug or not. And we can do semantic analysis, for example, detect the mood of a person who wrote a post. Um, we can uh, also recommend content based on mode. I know that uh, Microsoft are doing this. They're listening to the, the analyzing the, the music that you, uh, that you pick. And based on something that you write or hear, they can recommend different uh, music to you for purchasing. And also we can uh, perform document classification, which is, we, for example, we can classify documents by content. Um, if we want to know, if you want to read the entire PubMed um, data set uh, or corpus and decide, and we want to pick only the papers that talk about uh, pain related uh, genes. So we can either search for these genes. But if we don't know which genes are related to pain, then we can definitely read, analyze the papers that we download from PubMed and decide whether these uh, documents are related to pain or, or not by uh, detecting the topics that they talk about or they describe. Okay, now I want to define uh, language models and kind of talk about what I mentioned before, the context of a word. What is the context of a word when we talk about language models? It is defined as the history of the word, which means the previous words. Okay, for example, in this sentence, the history of previous is all the words to the left of the word previous. But recent models, they are much more sophisticated and they can use the, they define the context of a word by looking at both directions of the world. For example, uh, the world previous, they look at the left side of the world and also the right side of the world. So they look at both directions. So they better, and they better capture the, the structural uh, logic of the language. Um, words often come in a specific order, right? And, but we should consider different variations in this order. For example, what about different types of language like Chinese or left or right language 
uh, as opposed to right to left languages. And what about upper and lower case, right? Often genes would be uppercase. So it must be uh, meaning something or entities, usually names of people will be uh, using uppercase at the first, with the first letter. Okay, and also uh, we need to understand that different domains have different language variations. For example, biomedical language is different than Twitter language. And if we want to kind of simplify the definition of language models, um, it's not a very accurate definition, but just to make things very simple, it is the prediction. We can think of a language model as a model that can predict the words given the context. A language uh, model can predict the probability of a word occurring in that context. For example, if I'm going to give you the word, this sentence, and I, I told you uh, uh, this, uh, all of these words, I read them, and I'm asking you what would be the next word. A good model would be able to predict with high accuracy or high, uh, high success the, the next word in the sentence. Diving into one of the first language models that were developed, this is the Markov uh, assumption, uh, which is NGRAM. Um, we need to look uh, at the history of a word, but we don't want to look, if we have a very long sentence, we don't want to look at the entire history or at the entire left-hand side of the world. We only need between two and five words, and this is called the NGRAM model. Uh, this is a very complicated way of presenting it, but we're going to make it very simple and write it in human words like this one. So n-gram model, uh, where n is a variable, it can be one, two, or three. It's just uh, the problem of finding the probability of a word given its previous words. Uh, it captures the language structure based on the word statistics. And it predicts the occurrence of a word based on the occurrence of its n minus one previous words. Meaning if we have a bigram model, then n equals two, then you only need to look at the neighboring word, the first neighboring word from the left. If you look at this sentence, if I have the word given, um, I'm just gonna look at the neighboring word here. Okay, if I have trigon model, I'm going to look at the previous two words. Okay, so uh, putting it all in a mathematical equation, we can say that the probability of seeing, of predicting, or maybe that the next word would be word J, given that we saw word I, this is in a bigram model, is just the number of times that word I this word comes before word J divided by the total number of times that word I is in the data set. Let's look at a quick example of two gram. I have written the equation here, the probability here, so it will be easy to compute it. Let's assume that we have three documents. These are the three documents. And we want to find the probability of the word mining following the word text. Put, so let's put it in the probability uh, function. Given that we saw the word text, what is the probability that the next word would be mining? Um, we just count the number of times that we see text mining. So we see in the whole corpus. So we see it here. This is the first time I see it. This is the second time, and that's it. So I'm going to write two here. And then I'm going to count the number of times that I see the, the word text in the entire data set. So it's one, two, three. I'm going to write three here at the denominator, and I'm going to get the probability of seeing mining. If I saw the word text, it's 0 0.67. Uh, another question can be, what is the probability of uh, the next word uh, to be classification, given that I saw the word text? You can think of it as uh, um, an SMS. If you send someone an SMS, uh, 
and you are writing text, then the your phone has to predict what is the next word. It should offer you a, a next possible word. So this, if I'm calculating, repeating the same calculation, I'm getting that it's going to be a third. Um, so let's assume that your phone sees the word text. What would he recommend as the following word? If you are using this two gram model and you are given only these three uh, documents, then the next word is going to be obviously it's always going to be mining. Your model is always going to predict mining because it's using a maximum likelihood estimation. So the maximum pro maximum probability is this one, and therefore it will always predict mining. The word mining given this uh, set of documents. How are we going to train an NGAR model? Let's uh, assume, for example, that we collected from PubMed 1 million public PubMed articles, and we are going to split them into training and testing. Why do we even want to train an NGAR model? Because we might have this model, but this model might be uh, very inaccurate. And we want to test how accurate is our model. Therefore, what we are doing is we're going to collect a lot of documents, as many as possible. We're going to split them into training. For example, 70% of the documents of the 1 million is going to be a training, and 30% I'm going to randomly split them and save 30% of the documents for testing. Then I'm going to use this training data set to calculate the probabilities exactly as I calculated them here. And I'm going to predict words, which words, words from the testing set. Now, if my guesses of the model are accurate, are pretty accurate, then I have a good model. Otherwise, I need to think of some other model, maybe take three grams or four grams or five grams or, or some other model. But what happens if suddenly in this testing set, I see uh, some words that I haven't seen in the training set? How can I compute the probability? This probability, it, would, it will always be zero because I haven't seen this, the combination of any other word with a word from the testing set that does not appear in the training set. Uh, so there are different solutions. Uh, one of the easiest solution uh, possible is to use uh, Laplace smoothing, which means we are going to add one to every count. And then it's the, the meaning of it, the, the, the mathematical meaning of it is just um, taking the merge probability and kind of flatten it and give uh, split the probability mass to unseen words. But um, Let's say that we have an excellent model and we collected all of the papers in the world and we have seen all of the documents in the world and there is no surprises here. We, uh, we have no cases of words that we have not seen before. Um, still, there can be errors. How come? How is it possible if we have seen all the words and all of the combinations in the world, how can we still have mistakes? These mistakes can be made by humans. For example, if you type a word, then you have a mistake. You accidentally, accidentally type the word hello with the word with the letter J at the beginning, because H and J are very close layouts on the uh, keyboard. So uh, what we can do is to model the noise as the pro as a probability function. And here we have an error list of common words, spelling errors that are prevalent and we can model them. And based on this probability of an error, we can uh, make suggestions. Uh, I think that Avi said, mentioned once that he met this person, Norvig, but I'm not sure. Um, so this yeah, he's, he used to be a professor at Berkeley and he's now the uh, head of AI at Google. And I met him in like a meeting at the Google campus where he was saying how the Google search engine is using uh, over a hundred 
different types of features to rank results. So uh, it's an interesting statement that he made. Yeah. Okay. Um, moving on, this is uh, for you, Jesse. TFIDF. This is the first model that I'm going to talk about. It's a relatively simple model, but it's smart. Um, the idea behind TFIDF, and the acronyms are term frequency multiplied by inverse document frequency. Um, given a set of documents, words, the idea is that words that are more frequent in one document and are less frequent in all other documents are important. Uh, let's think of an example that we have many papers about uh, biomedical uh, studies and all of these studies are about genes. Then all of the papers would have the word gene in them. So the word gene is kind of meaningless to us in order to understand um, what represents a paper. But if we see, um, for example, one paper that contains the word pain and the other papers are uh, not containing the word pain, then this paper is probably very important because it is um, about a specific topic that is not reflected in any other topic, in any other uh, document. Okay, so trying to break uh, this model down, I'm going to start with the term TF, which is term frequency. This is basically just a number of count, number of uh, times that we see uh, word occur within document J. We're going over all the documents in our corpus and we are calculating the number of times that we see the term um, I, which term I mean the word I, uh, and we divide it by the total number of um, total number of uh, words that we have in our data set. What is document frequency? It's the number of times a word occurs within all documents divided by the number of documents containing that word. But we want to look at uh, another um, expression. We don't want to look at document frequency. We want to look at the inverse document frequency, which means that we want to divide the number of documents in the corpus by the number of documents that contains containing the word WI. And we want to use log over this term. Why? Let's assume that all of our, like, con continuing the previous examples, let's assume that we have multiple papers about genes and all of the papers contain the word gene. This means that the number of documents, let's say it's 1 million. And how many documents containing the word gene? Every document containing right everyone so it's going to be a million divided by by million it's going to be one and the inverse document frequency the importance of this word would be zero right because log of one is zero finally we are going to co compute the we're going to multiply tf by idf and then we're going to capture the importance of a term within a document and also capture the importance of a term or, or a word across all the documents in the data set. So it's in the data set. So it's going to be uh, this term here. Still, it's very difficult to understand the first time, and therefore we are going to perform or cover this example here. Let's assume that we have two documents, D1 and D2. D1 is this document, D2 is uh, this document, I love text mining, yeah. Now what we want to do is to create the, the um, uh, list of unique words uh, from both documents in the corpus. So we have text mining is fun, I love it. Yeah. How did I uh, create this uh, list of words? I just uh, read this entire document and I see the text here appears twice, but I'm only mentioning it, mentioning it here once uh, because 
in my head as a human being, I did tokenization, right? I, I saw there is a space between two worlds, so I decided to split and call this the first world, this the second world, and so on. So let's compute the TF. TF is just term frequency. Let's recall the uh, the um, the formula. It's this one. So what we want to do is just we count how many times we see the world text in the document. I see it one, and that's it. How many worlds are there in the documents? One, two, three, four. So it's one divided by four. The same goes for mining. It, it appears only one in the first document, and we have four, four um, words in the document, in the first document. I'm going to do it for every other word in the uh, dictionary that I have. I don't have the word I, right? So it's zero. I don't have love. I don't have yay. Yeah. These words are here in the second document. They are not in the first document. I'm going to repeat the same calculation for D2. But here I have one, two, three, four, five words. So I'm going to divide the number of times I see a word here by five. Now for IDF, I'm going to compute it for also for the first uh, and the second um, document. Uh, I'm going to compute it for every word. Let's recall how it looks like. It's going to be the log, the number of documents divided by the number of documents that contain the word. Right by by considering all of the data set, so this would always would would always be two, right? Because I have only two documents. So this this one here, the counter would always be two. What is going to change is the numbers here. Okay, let's see text. How many times have I seen the word text in both documents? I see it here and here, so it's going to be two. How many times have I seen the word mining? Also, it's in red, two. How many times the word is? It's going to be only one time here, and so on. Now, all I have to do is to multiply TF by IDF, but I have different TFs for every document. So I'm first going to take this vector here and multiply it by the IDF. So as you can see, it's a quarter multiplied by zero. Again, a quarter by zero, a quarter multiplied by 0 0.69. And I'm going to repeat the same calculation for TFIDF for the second document. And finally, I'm going to get these two vectors. For the first document, I'm going to get this vector. And for the second document, this is the vector that represents the second document. Now let's look at the word text and mining. They got zeros. Why? Because they appear in both documents. So they don't represent the first document. We can just throw them away or give them a weight zero. We also don't have other words. So obviously those words do not represent the first document because they don't appear in the first document. So they have zero. Is and fun, these words do represent this, the first document. And we have different weights for them here. Uh, also, the same explanation you can uh, apply it to the second document. And now, what we can do is we can compute the similarity between those two documents, right? Let's assume that these two documents are two papers submitted by different people. But uh, let's say that uh, the paper D2 copied some information from D1. And we want to see if this paper uh, was copied by another paper. If we compute the similarity between them and we have high similarity, we can say that someone copied from the other one. Uh, another example is, is if we have information we collected from Google about sports and we want to find all uh, the articles on the web that, have, that contain the same information. Or if we have a paper about uh, painting and we want all, to find all the articles that have similar information that are very similar to our paper. We can compute this. Of course, we have much more sophisticated models that can perform uh, better, but this is the, just the beginning. I have a Python code here that we can go over very quickly. If, then I'm going to find the exact same documents that I used in the example.
And now I want to convert the documents to the words to lowercase. And I did not did it here, right? There might be text here. The text might be in lowercase. So if I want to avoid these cases, I need to convert all the words to lowercase. Uh, where have I been here? Okay, so now everything is converted to lowercase. I'm going to tokenize the words. Just a minute. Maybe don't run it because maybe it can't be run in parallel. So please allow only me to run it. Okay. I'm going to tokenize the words, and now I get for each um, for each document I get a list of words, right? Now I'm going to use a dictionary. A dictionary is uh, just a second. A dictionary is these words that we got here. It's a set of words. And now I'm going to compute the term frequency for each document for the first one and for the second one. I'm going to just basically count the number of times that I see each word in the document. Let's print it and see. We see that love in the first document has zero occurrences, text has one, is has one occurrences. Now I'm going to compute the TF function. And you can see here that I'm going, uh, I have a dictionary. And this is the number of words in the document. And I'm just going to compute this function here, the, the log of documents divided by the documents that contain the word i. So this is the idea function. This is the, the TF. And so I computed it. You can look and see that I have very similar results here and here. And eventually, I would like to define a function that just compute TF by IDF. Um, so this is the function. And I'm multiplying and get. I'm getting for this first document, this, these are the numbers. And for the second document, these are the numbers. And they're pretty close to what we got here because I round the numbers and the computer does not round them. So you can go over this example after this presentation and better understand it. But we have covered all of the materials that will allow you to understand it. OK, let's uh, talk about more sophisticated models, NLP models for word embeddings. Um, like Alex mentioned before, sometimes I don't want to uh, use stemming, lemmatization. I don't want to remove stop words. I just want uh, to have a model that can understand what I'm writing. And it will be able to understand that um, a table is has the same meaning as tables and so on. So the main idea is to represent each word by its neighbors. What are neighboring words? These are the context of the words. For example, the word represent has neighbors idea and main. It also has neighbors the word a and word and the word word. Uh, and it depends how uh, how wide is the, the size of the window that I'm looking to the left and to the right. OK. And I want to generate a numeric vector to represent each word. This is often referred to as embedding. When you see this word embedding, you should know that someone took a word and represented this word as a vector. OK. Um, Models that are well known are word to vec and GLOVE. Um, these models use two layer neural networks with one hidden layer. The input is a word. Uh, of course, the input is not word as, uh, 
as all text, but the input is uh, we use uh, a representation, vector representation of the words, and I'm going to show you how to do it. And the output is the words in a vector space. The idea here that we try to uh, capture is that words with with common context will be closer in the vector space. And these models they capture semantic relation. The, this is uh, can also create some kind of pro problem because semantic relation words with uh, similar context have similar semantics. For example, the word happy and sad have different meanings, but they uh, can be seen with uh, diff with identical context. Um, they can be seen into similar worlds. For example, I was happy yesterday or I was sad yesterday. It's the same neighboring words to the words that I'm looking at, sad and happy. Um, okay, a similar application of word to vec is gene to vec in the biomedical uh, studies. Uh, and this model computes the likelihood that a gene will occur, the two genes will occur. Let's look at an example of that illustrates uh, the vectors of words. Let's say that we have the word king. So V of king is the vector of king. We can uh, represent it as a vector in a two-dimensional space. Uh, man is also another vector here. So if these two are vectors, we can do mathematical uh, operations on them. If we subtract man from king and we add the vector woman and you have a perfect model you would get queen right this is kind of amazing magic it means that your model actually captured um, the language but this won't always work because you have to train your model on multiple examples on millions of texts and if you train it on a small corpus then you might get very uh, um, you might get similar results, but it won't perfectly fit. And I will show you an example of how to train a world to work model in the following slides. Okay, but first I want to talk about how to represent text as numbers. Uh, let's talk about the world to work model. We have two different approaches that are kind of similar. The first one is a continuous peg of words. We want to learn the context of a word. It means uh, that we have to look at the neighbors of the word and try to kind of understand and capture the similarity of the words that, um, or the context of the word according to its neighbors. Um, so we define the window size. For this example, I'm going to define a window size of two. I'm going to look at the two words from the left and from the right. And um, let's say that I want to understand this word at location T. Then I'm going to look at the two words from the left and the two words from the right. And I'm going to try to predict somehow the word at location T. This is the SIBO method. Another method is skip run. Skip run. It predicts the surrounding words. Um, usually, we would use a window size of about five, but it totally depend, depends on you. It's, you can choose whatever size you want. And the context of words from the target words, uh, it's kind of, you can think of it as the inverse of SIBO. Um, it treats each context target pair as a new observation. Let's say, uh, as opposed to SIBO, now we have this word at location T, and we are trying to predict the words at the location T minus one or T minus two, or uh, the words that follow at location plus one and plus two. Let's look at an example because it's very vogue still, right? The first time I saw it, I had to see an example in order to understand it. So I'm gonna present an example using this sentence interactive and collaborative html5 gene list enrichment analysis tool this uh, sentence is taken from the enricher paper here that was published by the mayan lab and i'm going to use windows size of two so let's uh, follow the skip gram model and the focus is highlighted in yellow 
So let's say we have the interactive word. What are the neighbors of the word interactive? It's going to be interactive collaborative and interactive HTML5, right? These are the words that I can create if I'm looking at the window size of two. Next, I'm going to look at collaborative. It's going to be collaborative and interactive, collaborative in HTML5, and collaborative engine, and so on. I'm going to stop here because I think you got the point. Now, I have all of the pairs, right? I have the pairs of words for the skip go models model, and I want to pick a word and try to predict these model, these words. For example, if I pick interactive, I would like to predict collaborative. If I pick interactive, I also would like to predict HTML5. And this is the uh, structure of my neural network. I'm going to use words. Instead of feeding words into the model, I'm going to use one hot vector. It means that, let's say that here I have one, two, three, four, five words in the corpus. And I want to focus on the word uh, in on the second place. So I'm going to put one here. Now I'm going to predict the neighboring words. And I would like, if this was an autoencoder, I would try to predict the same vector here. And I would expect to have a high number here. But this is not an autoencoder. I'm trying to predict the neighboring words. And this is how I train my network. So eventually, after my model is uh, trained, what I can do is take each vector, hot vector here, throw it uh, through the network, and the results that I got here, I'm just going to ignore them. But what I am going to use is the hidden representation of this vector here after I have a trained model. And this is called the world embedding of the second world. W here. Okay, so, uh, so this is what we are doing. This is how we are training wall to vec using a skip count model. Now you can uh, you can uh, kind of convert every word in the data set into a vector representation, and you can compute similarity, and you can do all kind of tricks like this example here. Okay, another example is how to use the the SIBO model. Uh, usually we would use it, when to use SIBO and when to use SkipGram, we would use SIBO if we have a small corpus and if we want a low dimension representation of vector. So given, you know, returning to the example with the, the sentence from the enricher paper, let's say that I'm focusing on the collaborative uh, word, then the, now what I'm trying to do is I have uh, the interactive representation here. As you see, this is the first word. And I'm trying to predict collaborative. Next, look at the, at the red lines here. I'm going to take the next word, which is at the third place, and I'm going to try to predict, again, the collaborative. Now, I have many examples because I don't have just a single sentence. I have thousands and millions of documents so the world collaborative can sit next, next to interactive, next to HTML5, and next to many other words. So eventually, my network would capture the representation. Hopefully, my network would capture the representation of collaborative and will be represented uh, very accurately by this hidden state vector. Here's a world to vec representation or uh, implementation. So returning to the document that I've shared in the link, here you have the word to vec example. We are going to load the library, the necessary libraries. And this time, what I'm going to do is I want to use the URL to download the uh, full text of the enricher paper. So I put the PubMed ID here, and I'm downloading it and saving it. So you see it's here. I'm using Google Colab. So if you press this uh, library here icon, you would be able to see that I saved the enricher, the text of enricher paper in data uh, dot text. 
And now I'm going to read the text and save it to a variable. I'm going to replace these cap characters uh, with space. I'm going to iterate through the sentences um, in the file and tokenize them. Uh, next, I'm going to use the SIBO model. You see, it's as simple as that. I'm going to use uh, uh, windows, window size of five and uh, size of the hidden state uh, here. The size of the hidden uh, layer is going to be 100 because I want it to be very quick. Usually, the paper uh, about Waterbeck, uh, if I recall, they used 300. And I'm going to use minimum count of one. It means that I have seen the world at least once in my data set. Uh, let's print the results. We can see that I'm going to print uh, the cosine similarity between the word enricher and the word tool. Okay, so I'm computing the similarity. And you see that the similarity between the word enricher and tool, based on the model that I've trained, which includes only the, um, the enricher paper, is pretty high, right? Because enricher is a tool. It means that a lot of times we're seeing the uh, these words and richer and tool together. Uh, let's say that I want to calculate the most similar words to enricher, the top four similar words to enricher. Now I'm getting all this kind of information which is not that accurate, like the word D, of, in, libraries. It's not that accurate. Why? Because my model is not uh, representing the English language. It's only based on a single um, document and therefore it's not very accurate um, okay what what are the problems with world to vec it's uh, it it's an excellent model but it has some problems uh, one problem is that we have only one vector per word right if we have different meaning of a word it will always have the same representative vector let's take an example here, I'm using the word, the word go in different sentences, but they have different meaning. Go there, or let's play go. Here, go is a game, and here it's not a game, right? Uh, another very famous example is the word bank. It can, it can be a bank account, it can be the bank river. Um, and also, uh, it can yield, training a world to vec model can yield, yield unsatisfactory results when it is applied to biomedical text. Why? Uh, because the language of bi biomedical uh, word is different from other corpora. If we look at how the language is at social media, it's very different from uh, scientific papers. Therefore, we have to decide how we're going to train our model. Is it going to be on Wikipedia pages or on uh, scientific papers. This depends on the task that we want to achieve. And I'll show uh, an example of it when I talk about a project that we did here at the lab. Uh, possible solutions to understand uh, different meaning of, of words. For example, uh, another problem that walk to back has is that it lacks the uh, functionality to uh, look at the history of the words, we don't understand the, um, we don't have a, we don't capture a specific order of words, we just look at the neighboring words. But uh, possible solutions are deep language models, for example, the recurrent neural network and LSTMs, long short term memory. But these models also have several challenges. Um, for example, learning long distance context in NLP with RNN is difficult okay rnn is recurrent neural network in rnns what we do is we uh, learn the representation of a word and we, um, we 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 give the input of the first network to the second network and so on there the hidden representation and then we try to kind of capture the order of the words in the language but uh, so rna rnn is directional but sometimes we want to capture both directions of a language. We want to be able to look also left and right of the, of the sides of the word. 
and it is slow and it's hard to parallelize and access information many steps back. RNN, uh, they, these are and LSTMs, these are good models if you want to look up to a specific short distance. Okay. Um, if you look to the left of a world, it's kind of like the window size, and you want to remember the uh, what was what were the previous worlds, you want to remember the context, then these models are limited. RNN and LSTM are limited, although LSTM is better than RNN, both of them are limited and they are very slow to train. Um, but we as human, we want to understand the context of our world and we need, what, what do we do as humans? We usually check all of the worlds in the paragraph, right? For example, you can see here an example from the Mayan Lab uh, webpage that describe uh, what the lab is doing. This is only uh, partial text from the, from the webpage. And if I want to understand the context of the world biologist, I don't know what to do with it. What I am doing as human, I'm going to read this paragraph and then understand what biology is biologist is uh, referring to. If we want to kind of reconstruct this uh, functionality in computers, we would have to apply fully connected layers of all the words in the paragraph, which would be highly dimensional uh, vectors, and it would take forever to train. So this is not a good uh, solution. Um, what do humans usually do? Right, I'm not going to read the entire paragraph. What I'm going to read is to focus on the surrounding of this highlighted world, and then I can understand more or less the um, the functionality or the meaning of the context of the world biologist. And this is called attention. There's a very interesting paper, great paper by Google published in 2017 called "Attention is All You Need," uh, which means that you can pick the context to focus on. Um, you don't have to focus on the entire world. Not all of these worlds have the same probability of affecting the, uh, the understanding of this world. We only need to focus on specific worlds. Um, a good example from another area of research is uh, if you look at the picture, and uh, we have a picture with a stop sign with uh, uh, all kinds of information in the picture around the stop sign, like roads and and, uh, and uh, cars. And I'm asking you, what do you see in the picture? Then you're going to focus. Uh, let's say that only the stop sign has a focus on it, and everything else is kind of blurred. Then I'm going to focus on this photo, and a lot of people will say that this picture contains the uh, stop sign. Also, if you see a human being in a picture and behind him there is a view of uh, mountains, and I would ask you to describe the picture, you would say that there is a human being in the picture. Okay, so here's a quick introduction, very shallow introduction without a lot of details about how to compute the attention of, uh, of a single word. I'm going to present it with a sequence. Uh, machine translation task, we have, uh, for example, this uh, sentence here, and we want to translate it to another language. Uh, we have uh, uh, an encoder and decoder mechanism. These are called transformers in the paper here, in the attention paper. And what we do here, as opposed to uh, regular uh, recurrent neural networks, we are going to use the random state in parallel of the worlds and now, instead of just using these vectors, we're going to give some kind of score to each word. And we're going to say this word is much more important in, in predicting the next sequence, in predicting the, uh, the translation, or in predicting the next word um, than other words. So we should focus a lot of uh, more on this word. So if we multiply it by the uh, attention score, and again, I'm not covering how to calculate the attention score here. Um, if you multiply the attention score, the vectors by the attention score, 
and then we can calculate the the new vectors and kind of predict better in better with better accuracy the next world. The main difference to uh, and when we compare it to other models is that other models like recurrent neural networks and LSTM can look back, let's say up to five, 10 or whatever window size, uh, which is pretty small. Here in this model, you can look at a single time at all of the words in the data set. And you can kind of say to yourself, okay, I'm looking at every word, but today, uh, while considering a single word, for example, if I'm looking at this sentence, the word states can have different focus than other words. It can have different focus regarding, if I'm considering all of the different words, I can focus, for example, only on hidden. Hidden would get highly uh, recommended um, or, or, or softmax would get highly recommended by this model. Uh, I know it's not very clear because uh, if you want to fully understand it, uh, uh, we need another 15 minutes to the class and try to understand it. But I have a video here that will make you understand it uh, more intuitively. Um, let's see this video. This, and the instruction is you need to count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. Okay, can anyone uh, say the number of times he counted or she counted? 15, okay, I can see. So you're correct, Errol, but let me ask you that. Let's make you this. Have you uh, seen the gorilla, Errol? Pay attention. You can see here there's a gorilla walking. So this kind of illustrate how your focus is uh, different every time you have a different task. So if your task is to predict the next word, it depends on which word you're focusing. If your text would be to find the gorilla, you would be focused on that. Uh, several people have missed the gorilla, and, but they got the perfect answer of 15 passes because I gave them a different task. But if I had told you to find the gorilla, I'm sure that everyone would have seen the gorilla passing. So this is kind of the same thing that we're doing about uh, words. We're trying to say, given that I'm located here in the sentence, I'm seeing this word, I want to predict the next word, or I want to predict the next, uh, the word to translate to, um, what words should I focus to get the best results of the task? Okay. And this brings me to talk about BERT. It's a bidirectional encoder representation from transformers. BERT only uses the encoder part of the transformers that I've shown uh, in the previous slide. And it can look at the same time at previous and the next word. How? It all depends on the training. We have two uh, task of tr tasks of training the model. The first one is try to predict the next sentence given a sentence uh, bert uh, the bert model uses the sep token we insert a sep token to indicate that the next sentence is beginning at the location of the sep token and we're trying to predict the next sentence for example i have a question and i would like to predict the answer a question and the answer these are um, two different sentences the second training is using uh, trying to predict the uh, missing token. Um, I'm going to give the model a sentence. I'm going to cover 50% of the token. I'm going to use the label mask, the token mask instead of a word. And I'm going to try to predict. I'm going to tell the model, try to predict the mask tokens. What are the next words? What would you expect? 
So this is uh, the two training tests that Bert was trained on. But um, wh what is the difference between this model and bi bidirectional LSTMs, right? Uh, for example, Elmo is another language uh, model developed by Google, which uh, applies two LSTMs that look forward and backward. Uh, but Bert also uh, is doing it. So what, what is the difference? The difference is that Elmo uh, does not consider the previous and next tokens at the same time, but Bert does. Uh, and Bert does not use um, LSTM and uh, RNNs. It uses encoder structure uh, instead of LSTM, as opposed to Elmo, which makes it uh, much faster in training. And these encoders incorporate multiple attention blocks, uh, which makes the model much more accurate, increase the accuracy of the model. And another strength of this model is that it can be fine-tuned by uh, on a small data for different NLP tasks such as classification. Um, let's look at the embedding of BERT. They are also different. Here we have, let's say we have a sentence. Uh, now we have uh, embedding tokens. You can think of it as, uh, for example, the, the result of a word to vec model, although uh, BERT uses the word piece tokenization. And then BERT, if, if we were talking about the word to vec this is the part where we were, uh, uh, it, we would stop. BERT also adds segment embedding, which means that it knows that these words belong to the first sentence and these words belong to the second sentence. And also it uses positional embeddings, which means that let's say we have the word bank, if it's located in the first position, it would have different uh, encoding than the word bank that is location, located at the seventh position. Okay, and pay attention that the, the index starts at zero. And then after we have the word embeddings, we use encoders. We have two different, we have many, but two main different types of the BERT model, which is the uncased uh, uh, or cased large. This model has uh, 24 layers of encoders. You can think of it as 24 boxes of encoders. Each encoder contains a self-attention model and a feed-forward neural network, which is uh, the input to the next encoder. At, at the end, each word that comes in here, which are the words from the embedding here, they are represented as a vector here. And in the base model, it has 12 layers. You get uh, a vector with uh, 768 dimensions. Um, and this model is uh, achieves uh, one of uh, it was able to achieve top performance on um, several NLP tasks because it is able to look at other words in the input sentence while encoding uh, a word, and also it can focus on relevant parts of the input sentence. Um, lastly, I want to talk about projects that involve the text mining at the, at the lab. The first one is the Enricher bot. Uh, some of you have also seen it. Uh, it is uh, using the BERT model, a fine-tuned BERT model on a downstream classification task to detect gene-related tweets on Twitter. You can read the paper here uh, if you want to get more details about it. And the second uh, project that we have at the lab is the tool story, which I talked about, uh, I think, two weeks ago at a uh, lecture about automatic detection of bioinformatic tools and databases. The task here was to fine tune the BioBERT, which BioBERT is a BERT model trained over uh, PubMed, because as I mentioned before, if you have a language that, uh, that is more scientific language, you would want to train your model not on social data, but on the scientific uh, representation of the scientific papers that contain kind of different type of language. And then we train this model to decide whether uh, corpus of documents are tools or data sets 
or not. So these two, I'll, I, although I mentioned it uh, in a few words, um, it's pretty complicated tasks that uh, involves uh, uh, language models and um, require kind of looking into the data set and decide if you have good results is not just applying the model to uh, like pushing a, a, a play button and it would work. You have to understand what you're doing and to evaluate the results and kind of fine tune the model to get the perfect results that you want. Uh, finally, the conclusions from these presentations for you to take away is that NLP is an important research field for biomedical informatics, and many machine learning algorithms have been proposed for biomedical studies. Recent deep learning models achieve the state-of-the-art performance in many biomedic biomedical studies. And finally, biomedical systems are complex, and there is need for developing, need and room for developing uh, new NLP-based algorithms.